Two and a half years ago, I hosted Villain Songs Month, where we did countdowns for the best villain songs in media. But now, I want to give some attention to villain songs made by those consuming said media. The fans. Villain songs are a favorite among nerdcore artists, and chances are you have listened to several of them yourself. Same rules as Villain Songs Month. They have to have lyrics, can be sung by or about the villain, or sung from the villain's perspective, and only one per franchise. Otherwise, they'd all be from FNAF. Now, because this is fan-made villain songs, I have to put in some additional rules. One, only one per creator. Two, no parody songs. These need to be original compositions. And three, the song suitability. Like, can we envision the song fitting neatly into a movie, stage show, a TV show, a video game, or even a book? Yes, those exist. Pick up Dollar Tolkien. Also, one more thing before we begin. Please remember that there are an unholy amount of fan-made villain songs, and narrowing it down to 10 was harder than you think. Not only is it harder to get noticed in the genre of fan-made content, but even then, a lot of the songs that got popular felt a little off. Like, they're good, but it was hard to decipher which songs felt like real villain songs and which ones felt like they were just random posturing for the sake of posturing. Like, they were tributes. Eventually, many of them started to blur together. All that's to say, Please be nice about my choices. There are enough fan-made villain songs to make a whole other month's worth of countdowns for them. People have some favorites to make villain songs out of, don't they? Most of them are indie horror or adult cartoons. And most of the Undertale ones were parodies. Not dissing, just noticing patterns. <laughs> Speaking of the FNAF song, I might as well just get it over with. Like I said, go through every FNAF song would take me forever. Same with the lore, but since we're here, let's talk about William Afton, FNAF's infamous Purple Man. Purple guy! Afton was the co-owner of the Fazbear Entertainment Company and the one who created the animatronics to begin with. He's also the serial killer behind the deaths of many children and stuffed their corpses and souls into the robots he made. Yeah, it's messed up. Given there are a lot of songs for FNAF out there, there are quite a few for Afton himself. The one I chose is the one I think got his personality the best. Unbroken by Man on the Internet. These machines are singing with the blabbing and the bleeping neat the arcade lights. Saccharin cacophony that mass the living battery it hides its cries. Yep, Afton's one of those types. He's not just a murderer. He's an artist. For some context, Afton acts as the charismatic inventor on the surface, but deep down he takes glee from his killings, seeing children as a means to an end for him. Leave everything you hear from me, the sweet nothings behind my golden smile. Here's a pet and toys will get returned if they just follow and be good a while. Children never listen, should be seen and never heard. Always crying out until you stuck them in a burn And rise and get new life all for the low price of a child As for the why he's doing this, he's a coward who fears the aftermath of death He uses the souls of children as a way to gain immortality Don't Ask me how he thinks that will work, as you can probably tell, he's not the most sane! The song does a good job not only telling us Afton's warped perspective, but also the changes between the human Afton and the purple man, showing us the duality that he holds within himself. So clear to me and my immortality. 
Imagine Athens' name shall be forever. In the end, he does get his wish. He gains immortality, but with his soul stuck in the spring trap suit. The revenge the children's souls gained was sweet, but led to new problems. Athens' catchphrase is, I always come back. He's the type of villain who will always return no matter what happens. Even with his body mangled, his soul trapped, fueled by his lust for killing and his drive to achieve immortality, his will shall not be diminished and he will make sure his name is etched forever. He is truly unbroken. <laughs> favorite Disney baddies do after those accursed heroes get their happily ever after? I mean, besides chilling on the House of Mouse waiting for Disney Plus to take a hint. Well, filling in the blanks is often where the fans come in, and according to Patty Kate Productions' The Villain's Lair, they hang out in a spooky castle plotting their revenge with menacing collab songs. I really love the concept of this web series. Usually, the villains and their songs are the best parts of Disney flicks. You know, back when they gave a hoot and didn't have to play it safe. Among these dastardly collabs is the first season's second episode, Tough Love, featuring the company's most wicked stepmoms, Lady Tremaine, Mother Gothel, and Queen Grimhild. Wait, her name's Grimhild? Oh, uh, the evil queen from Snow White. Anywho, these nasty divas come together to sing about what great mothers they were. How the heck do you justify trying to kill off your child for having a prettier face, turning your dead husband's kid into a maid in her own house, or child abduction and gaslighting? Break their spirit so they obey. Now they'll do anything you say. Maybe you call it cruel, but others would call it love. Tough love. Little childhood drama built character. Aw, ain't they the spitting image of motherly vibes? Versus like that really show off how brilliant the song is. We already know how horrible these three are just from their movies alone, but this just adds a few extra steps. They claim they tried to toughen their kids up by treating them like dirt. It's implied that Grimhild snuffs Snow White's father. Gothel even says she never wanted kids. Oof. And oh, that excuse gets a lot heavier if you've seen the Tangled series. Along with having a great beat, I love how Tough Love ties these three miserable bats themes together. They all basically commit the same crime, mistreating their adopted daughters for their own selfish desires. The only real difference is that one of them made it out alive at the end of the day. In a way, Tough Love kind of reminds me of A Story Told from The Count of Monte Cristo, another fantastic villain song about three irredeemable creeps coming together to try and justify their common goal of destroying an innocent person's life. The theme worked brilliantly there and it works just as well here, adding an extra level of depravity to these classic villainesses. Call us wicked, call us mean, cruel and everything in between. You can say it's unjust, turning their dreams to dust. This is what we call love, love. Now if only Actual Disney could remember how to get that deep with its films, but no, we got a villain in name only singing a doo doo pop number with redundant lyrics. I let you live it for free and I don't even charge you it. When you hear fan made villain songs and take into account that I'm a brony, there's a song that I'm willing to bet a lot of you immediately thought of. Discord by Eurobeat Brony. This legendary song sings about how Discord took the world away, painting him as this almost apocalyptic threat. It's iconic in the community. And as for what I think about it, well. <laughs> Now, now, put those pitchforks down. I'm not saying it's bad. It just doesn't really sound like a Discord song. 
even at his worst, Discord's more of a prank obsessed trickster god who just finds messing with mortals fun, like a kid playing with toys. Far from the tyrannical, punishing evil force that the song portrays him as. Now, if only there were a song that fit our Draconicus friend while still sounding villainous. Well, he did get reformed. Maybe we need to look for the one where he's not the villain, but someone else is. Hmm. I know! And gentlemen and everything in between feast your eyes on the most chaotic thing the multiverse has ever suffered okay yeah i know what you're thinking does death battle count is this a villain song if it's just a backing track yes and yes for one death battle is a fan-made project as professional as it is it's a series analyzing characters from different media and interpreting them as fans to see what would happen in a crossover as for the second point it's a song sung about and by bill cypher and discord so even if you don't think discord counts as a villain anymore bill absolutely is it counts so with that out of the way discord and decipher is insane <laughs> Right out of the gate, this is a song less explaining some sort of grand master evil plan and more of these two chaos gods having fun dissing each other while also messing with the audience. Man, props to Brandon Gates and Mr. Goatee for managing to capture the sound and inflections of Bill and Discord while also keeping the song going. Discord's insults are more playful and creative, using poetic language and even puns to make fun of the triangular terror. Bill, on the other hand, is fueling his ego, boasting about his achievements while also touching on his murderous side. Tell me Discord, have you won any award for best dress? Cause tell me impress. Not a single part of you matches it all clashes. You'll probably look better once I've burnt you to ashes. <laughs> and this isn't even mentioning the main course that seems like these two are directing their attention to the audience itself, asking them to sell their souls to them and try to figure out some hidden truth, spreading chaos. Just like how complex and close the debate for the fight was and how looking through every detail can drive one crazy, it gets meta, just how you'd expect from this fight. Sell your soul, take control by gold. Can you decipher the secret meaning? Line by line, wrong or right, pick a side. Wait, run that back. What did that say? Oh, Yates, you cheeky fucker. And let's not forget to give props to Infotron, whose backing track captures the mysterious, crazy, and mind-melting nature of these two, sounding similar to something that would be in Gravity Falls, but also sounding like the very soundtrack is actively fought over and affected by their reality warping. Of all the songs made for Death Battle, Discord and Decipher feels like it truly captures the character of these two, feeling not only like a song they're singing to each other and the audience, but sounding like they're fighting over the song itself. Hats off to you, Brandon Gates. I just hope the song didn't require any mm, extra help. Guess it's not the first time someone made a deal with the devil for musical talent. In case we've never met, hi, I'm Josh Scorcher. I talk about video games and the perpetual blunders of the industry, especially from repeat offenders like our favorite delusional clown, Todd Howard of Bethesda. I made it abundantly clear how when they muck up, they really muck up. What a fantastic marketing gimmick. Everybody's a sucker for horse armor. And you better believe others have gotten the chance to clown on Mr. Howard's boneheaded plays. Of course, one of the catchiest spoofs, and one you probably saw coming, was the Chalk Eaters, It Just Works. Yes, corporations count as villains. F*** you. Look at these ongoing downward spirals and tell me otherwise. 
The song itself is a jumpin' high-energy jazz number featuring Dear Old Todd, performed by Kyle Wright, not even trying to deny all the dumb, shady practices his company's taken part in. Overhyped games turning out buggy as hell, inflated DLCs, flashy shows covering up mediocrity, that frickin' horse armor! He does it all and relishes every second of it. You know why? And in a way, he's kind of right. Despite everything, Bethesda is alive and well to disappoint and rip us off another day. Ooh, and the bridge in the middle. An angelic chorus of angry, frustrated consumers crying out for the company to clean up its act. We don't There are so many reasons why the song's gotten so much traction, from its biting satire to its catchy, energetic rhythm, all the way to that epic choir bit. It perfectly encapsulates what a three-ringed circus the gaming industry has become, all while giving Tom the presence of a Disney villain. Bravo! We've memed the heck out of the song, and unless things change, you better believe the show ain't over yet. So, this next song's about death. And I don't mean it metaphorically, or rhetorically, or poetically, or theoretically, or in any other fancy way. I can't name a soul who initially thought a second Puss in Boots movie was a good idea, except for DreamWorks. But holy Smash Mouth's all-star! Puss in Boots The Last Wish was the movie that the studio needed after an onslaught of so-so sequels. From the drastic change in animation style to the impeccable visual storytelling, and of course, giving us two of the best antagonists in modern day animation. One of them was an irredeemable monster that was snubbed in favor of Pinocchio. Oh wait, that actually happened twice. And the other was a wolf that took on the role of the Grim Reaper himself. While Big Jack Horner was meant to be more of a handsome Jack type, with the snark in complete disregard for his servants, Death is a dark and intimidating hunter who has literally kept track of our hero's past lives by marking them on his sickles. Needless to say, the internet went ham on making villain songs for this personification of death. You know, when they weren't shipping him with Luna from Hell of a Boss. There were quite a few good ones, and I ultimately landed on the song Death's Doorstep, written and produced by Musiclide. What he likes to do with his songs, instead of performing himself, hire other nerdcore artists to be his vocalists. And this time around, he hired singer Totoro-chan. While not a very well-known singer on YouTube, she is a frequent collaborator with Musiclide, and her vocal performance here perfectly captures what one might feel when confronting what could be their final moments. Speaking of which, the lyrics are actually very unique, while simultaneously being what you'd expect. Most fan-made songs about death tend to be told from his perspective, as he's chasing down our titular hero. This song, however, is told from the POV of someone running from death. It touches on the tale of how Puss and Boots always laughed in the face of death, but once he sees his face for the first time, he realizes that by living on the edge, he may fall off and never get back up. Not just the lyrics, the music's also incredibly unique. When listening to most of the songs made about death, I noticed that they were mostly posturing rap, and it got very samey. This one is a bit more pop-oriented, and it has some decent chord progression as a result. I especially love the scythe sounds that get louder and louder as the song goes on, like how death slowly but surely comes for us all. Oh. 
I made myself sad. Death's doorstep may be similar in terms of exploring themes of mortality, but it gets the spot of how it separates itself enough from other songs made about death. It puts the listener in the shoes, or boots, of someone trying to flee the inevitable end. But as the song and the movie suggest, we need to live our lives to the fullest because, try as we may, we won't be able to cheat death. <laughs> Now, if only dreamers could keep making beautiful movies like Puss in Boots The Last Wish instead of doing whatever they did recently. Fandom culture really is something, huh? In Hasbun Hotel's case, all it took was just a pilot for the internet's creative juices to flow like crazy, as well as ruthlessly pestering Vivsy Pop on her socials and conventions. As a Broadway-inspired show taking place in hell of all places, of course, the various demons and sinners had their share of songs emphasizing their more violent and, uh, sinful traits. But out of everyone in the cast, none have captivated fans more than the radio demon, Alistor. This Creole-inspired serial killer immediately established himself as one of the series' standout characters, and for good reason. So, of course, everyone had their shot at making a villain song to fit him, but which to choose? Insane and Alistair's game were big contenders, but <sighs> pound for pound, had to go with paranoid DJ Smile Like You Mean It. This world is run on but a simple rule. Not a case of what you know, but who. Uh, yeah. Here we go. Looking at you, I think perhaps you're wanting more than table scraps. So just imagine what a man like me could do for you. Like any good Broadway song, Smile Like You Mean It tells a story. We follow a nameless sinner down on his luck, resenting his place in the world. He wishes there was some way to climb up the ladder, some way to get back at those who have wronged him. Fortunately, or unfortunately, it seems his desperation has caught the attention of a certain someone who offers him a deal that seems too good to pass up. Right away, Paranoid DJ deserves all the applause for writing, producing, and singing this entire thing. Alistair is written and sounds nearly identical to how he is in canon, which is quite the feat because, reminder, this was when all we had was the pilot. Alistair's a true salesman, and his proposal is in the form of a jazzy big band swing tune with tons of his radio flair. Alistair is an entertainer at heart, and this song absolutely entertains. Yet true to his devilish nature, Alistair brazenly admits that this deal isn't all that it seems. Even our right states that he's waiting with bated breath to watch the poor schmuck falter and spiral downward, yet he still sounds convincing. And then he ropes Husk into it. Husk is a bitter, drunken soul who, as revealed in the show, was once an overlord who gambled his soul away to Alistair, unable to pay his debts with anything but servitude. While the song came out before the full reveal of Husker's plight, Husk's verse still conveys his story as a cautionary tale. He doesn't want to be here, and you can tell. He warns the sinner about Alistair's power and basically states that once the radio demon has his sights on you, He's not letting go. They say you reap what you sow, and in this town you should damn well know that what the radio demon wants, he's gonna take. What? I've seen him kill hell's greatest evils, shake the status quo in the people. So if you think you're getting out of this, big mistake. Now, now, sourpuss. Even with all these warning signs, Alistair's deal is still very tempting because. What other choice do you have in hell? Everyone's out to get you, so why not take a deal with one of the top dogs? Surely nothing ever goes wrong when you sell your soul to a demon. Ha 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 ha. Ah, sarcasm. 
Smile like you mean it tells such a convincing story that it feels like it absolutely could belong and has been proper. Alistair's persistence in smiling no matter what comes your way and Malicious' insistence on his deal being absolute feels almost like Paranoid DJ knew how Alistair's characterization was gonna go in the show. It's good enough to be canon, and that's a hyperbole, by the way. One of Paranoid DJ's other songs, Look My Way, recently became canon to Hell of a Boss. If that's not a sign of the way Paranoid DJ can capture these characters, I don't know what is. Okay, I swear this isn't me bending the rules to put two Pony Villain songs on the same list, because Discord technically isn't the villain in Discord and Decipher. Bill is. Now we can talk about an actual fan villain song from the franchise. We touched on a few MLP G4 villain tunes back when I did Villain Songs Month, but if you thought the villain songs Daniel Ingram made for these characters were amazing, Look at the massive menagerie of villain songs made by the Brony fandom. There are several obvious choices for this list you absolutely need to go listen to right now. Stronger, sung by Black Griffin and featuring the voice of Apple Bloom, the aforementioned Discord song I made a nostalgia critic joke about. Heck, that's not even counting the songs based on fan fiction. And don't even get me started on the majestic heavy hitter The Moon Rises by Pony Phonic. With all these fan favorite, fan made villain songs, it was tough to decide which one to choose. In the end, I went with. None of these. That's just maddeningly unhelpful. Instead, I'm talking about Son of the Night by JYC Rowe. Yeah, I know it's not one of the iconic fan made villain songs for the good old days of 2012, nor is it about any of the first MLP villains that may come to your mind like Discord, Cozy Glow, or Queen Chrysalis, but. Come on, man, this song is so freaking epic. Just listen to it. Son of the Night is a song that takes place from the perspective of a pony who worships one Daybreaker. Princess Celestia's equivalent to Nightmare Moon, who appears in the episode A Royal Problem. Yes, I know she was just an apparition in a dream, but it counts because... If Luna can turn into Nightmare Moon, you can absolutely turn into me. Daybreaker is essentially a representation of Celestia's dark side, a glimpse into the world of eternal day. But for the ponies singing this song, that's all well and good. The lyrics sing the praises of Daybreaker and convey a longing for the light of the morning to reign over the land. After all, isn't light more reverent and purer than darkness? Isn't light always good and darkness always bad? Okay, this better not secretly be a Xehanort song because he doesn't deserve one this good. This song, as any song about Daybreaker should, includes a lot of parallels to Nightmare Moon. It may even, dare I say, contain parallels to church music. I mean, the way the song is written is meant to worship, and you can definitely hear the similarities. It really makes you wonder just how much power Celestia is holding back. What if underneath this calm, reserved, and dignified ruler, there's something more reckless, selfish, sinister even? From a musical perspective, this song is breathtaking. The way JYC Rowe's orchestral sound and Felicia Ferreira's vocals come together is just beyond description. The way the orchestra hits on each chorus and then swells up for that final chorus at the end, it's, it's a song out of League of Legends. I don't know how many songs from the fandom that are about Daybreaker, so it's nice that JYC Rowe could give her a moment in the spotlight. Horror indie games get so much fan content, it's ridiculous. While that does mean I have to sift through a lot of so-so entries, there's so many that at least one of them has to knock it out of the park. So let's check out Bendy and the Ink Machine. 
a game that puts a sinister spin on Walt Disney's humble beginnings by having the star attraction be a singing demon that was likely a rejected Cuphead boss. The story revolves around Henry Stein as he is invited back to the old animation studio by his colleague and partner Joey Drew. And let's just say that Henry's old characters aren't quite happy to see him after he left them to be forgotten. So, given the modern spin on classic animation, that probably means we're gonna get some swing? Oh yeah! Now the ink is rolling fast to say your prayers and hope you last cause it's a hell of a show <laughs> And you're in the front row <laughs> Welcome home, you've been away for far too long The song Welcome Home, first made by Haley Lane, gives us a look into the mind of our titular ink demon as he welcomes Henry back with a 1920s ragtime number The song was first produced in 2018, but for this entry, we went with the 2022 remaster made with the help of Alicia Michelle and Cody Fulbrook on the trombone The original song was already catchy as hell, but this version of the song elevates that. The lyrics aren't nearly as deep as the previous entries on the list, but there are plenty of clever references here and there, and Benty's resentment for Henry is made abundantly clear. This may be a fun, bouncy, upbeat ragtime number, but you really feel the venom, betrayal, and yet still playfulness of the villain thanks to Haley's delivery. And now, as the curtains finally close, you'll see the result of what you chose Did it have to go this way? Maybe if you'd only stayed All this tragedy could have been prevented But Springing from the posters and the reel on the tape A new dimension for us could be the seal of your fate And all the years you left us rotten here with nothing but rejection Made us bitter and cold Now give us what we wrote And yes, this isn't the only song made about Bendy and the Ink Machine Build Our Machine is a fan favorite for sure, and for good reason, I love me some Electro Swing. But I prefer this one because of how accurate it is to the time period. Everybody involved in this song clearly understands Bendy and the Eek Machine well enough to make this sound almost like a theme song for the game. It's made even better with a fantastically done animated music video. Though if I had any thoughts on Bendy's feelings towards Henry, just be glad you didn't live to see yourself become modern day Disney. You know, maybe I'm taking too many pot shots at Disney. You're the reason why I get up at 4 o'clock in the afternoon and pump iron until my chest is positively sick. You don't need to be that deep in the DC fandom to recognize that Batman and the Joker have a very um, turbulent relationship. To coincide with the Arkham games, Miracle of Sound decided to really highlight the dysfunctional dynamic within eerie waltz by the clown prince of crime himself, appropriately titled a Joker song. Okay, what the title lacks in originality, the song itself makes up for with substance. The melody is slow and sinister, almost resembling a fairground organ. <laughs> Through the twisted tune, the Joker is serenaded the bat, presumably from the other side because of the whole dead thing, and the lyrics paint a vivid picture of what goes on in that psychotic brain of his. We are two of a kind, violent, unsound of mind, you're the yin to my yang, can't you see? And if I were to leave, you would grumble and grief, face and bats, you'd be lost without me. But of course, bats and the Joker are the same. Two normal schmoes who fell out the deep end after one bad day. One dressed up in flying rodent tights trying to save the world, the other got his skin bleached and promised to make the world smile to death. At least, that's how Joker sees it. In reality, this whole song is just him projecting. He's not trying to convince the bat that he needs the clown, he's trying to convince himself. He's the one who's lost without his other half, and if there's one thing that truly frightens him, it's being forgotten. I need you. Poetic. The song came out only a few years before Arkham Knight, and it predicted Joker's final hours perfectly as he's forced to admit what we already knew. Alrighty, Joker's song has a lot of street cred, being one of the earliest fan-made villain songs out there. But what really places it this high on the list is how it encapsulates the Joker's narcissistic view of Batman. He repeatedly states how lost Bats would be without him, desperately hoping that if he says it enough, people will think it's the truth. And of course, being the Clown Prince, he hides it all behind his sadistic swagger. Kind of a shame this isn't an official song cause I could see Mark Hamill rocking this track. More so since it feels like Miracle of Sound really 
gets the character. You'd be lost. You'd be lost. Face it, bats. You'd be lost without me. Makes sense. That's for the most part, Rocksteady got what made Batman and his baddies so... No! No! Bad game! Bad! You don't count! Stop it! But you just got in my way I promise honey I can feel your pain And maybe I enjoy it just a little bit But that makes me You can dance with the devil in! Pennywise likes the devil. We have so much fun together, but no one's dying to play with Joker. Except for maybe he's like together for a villain most cruel because this time he's here to rule. the tale of king k rule and his fandom is something truly special to fully understand this song we need to take a moment to reminisce about this crocodile's reign Starting as the big bad for Donkey Kong Country, K. Rule at first glance seems to be your standard Bowser clone, just stealing bananas from an ape instead of stealing a princess from an Italian. But take a closer look at things and, weirdly, K. Rule goes through a form of character development? Yeah, K. Rule's story is complex enough to fill an entire segment on its own, but to keep this one for lasting 10 minutes, we'll go through the Spark Notes version. After the destruction of Crocodile Island in Donkey Kong Country 2, K. Rule kinda lost his mind in 64, outright threatening his minions with death and completely set on mass monkey murder. After that, pesky real life reared its ugly head and Microsoft buying Rare pretty much crippled the Donkey Kong Country series for the foreseeable future, and the Kremlins had their appearances relegated to just cameos and spin-offs if they were lucky, until K. Rule's last physical appearance for 10 years in Super Mario Sluggers. Fans were desperate to see them back and yet, nothing. Even as the Donkey Kong Country series returned, our king was nowhere to be found. Here's where we find the Kremlings, worrying the same thing we are, mulling over their lack of work as it were, wondering just where K. Rule had gone. But beneath their tavern, in the bowels of the ship, someone was stirring, mulling over his failures, and plotting. Immediately, K. Rule makes his presence known at is that Benedict Campbell? In individuals, insanity is rare. But in crews, cutthroats, countries, and cremospheres, it is the rule. Yup, this fan project got the original voice actors from the cartoon on board. And Campbell still manages to capture the king's slimy yet sophisticated voice. But what's a singer without their song? K. Rule's busted out a showstopper. Tip the scales. His ultimate plan is to bring the Kremlings back and to bring them back strong. The ultimate takeover of DK Isle. Burn the island to the ground to lure out Donkey Kong in one final invasion. If we tip the scale, I'll send them all to jungle jail. Must tip the scale, let's make that cretin ride and flail. We tip the scale, reclaim our land, our holy Shall not fail. We'll end this monkey's tail. We'll tip the scale. Let's tip the scale. Oh, 
he's not just done there. Like K. Rule's own personas, the song switches genres like crazy. Going from slow and dramatic to faster as K. Rule laments his obsession with the Kongs. And then sounding almost heroic as K. Rule promises his minions a return to form. And as K. Rule storms the beaches of the island, stealing the banana horde with the chilling message of his return, the Kremlings break into a triumphant cry of victory and I am Kremling, I am king, we'll reclaim what's to be had. Take on asunder as we cry blood and thunder, my command is ironclad. But it was all in K. Rule's head. His delusions of grandeur have driven him to madness, a laugh turning into a cry. He might truly have been forgotten. Yet, in the post-credits, we see that he's managed to at least show his face again to his minions. And as DK goofily forgets his nemesis, a contrast to the silent and angry figure K. Rule imagined him as, K. Rule gets an idea to crash a party. This was a prelude to his smash reveal. There is so much to dissect here. Return to Crocodile Island is a love letter to the entire story of the Kremlings, both in-game and meta-wise. There are so many references and gags to the history of Donkey Kong Country. So many people contributed to this work of art and Alex Henderson's animation is just oh, beautiful. And what puts it at number one is, well, this is a story only the fandom could have told. It's as much about the fans' journey to get him into Smash and back into relevance as it is about K. Rule's resentment toward his hated enemy. I'm the Fiery Joker, and never forget the power of fandom. Raise your flags high, and never stop celebrating the things you love. Kaboom! Hey everyone, this is Josh. If you like this video, please like, subscribe, leave a comment, and share the video around. Please check out my other social media like my Twitter, Twitch, and Tumblr. Check out my other channels such as Joshua Burner for reactions and other stuff, Dragon Fighter Gaming for tabletop, and Bob Equestria for cartoons. Consider checking below the video and donating to my Patreon, Streamlabs for my merchandise, or becoming a YouTube member. Thanks for watching.